Welcome everybody, I'm Jackie and today I'm going to show you how to make this quilted wall hanging of a small building. Now you probably join me on this channel typically to see what I'm doing with my sea glass. Well today I'm doing a quilt art project so it's quite a bit different but I am going to include a little bit of sea glass in this project so if you're a big sea glass fan you're not totally out of luck here I will show you a little bit of sea glass stuff as well. But if you're joining me to do the quilt art workshop, then this is what we're working on. And I had a request from my local quilt guild to do a workshop for them on how to make this small building because I do quite a bit of quilt art as well as sea glass art. And I was booked to do that workshop in April. And of course, here we are in the middle of this crazy pandemic and everything's canceled, so the workshop got canceled. So I suggested to the girls, well, why don't I do a video of it and then everybody can stay at home and still do the workshop and I'll post it up on my channel so you can easily access it. So that's why I'm doing this video. So welcome to anybody from the Town and Country Quilt Guild. It's, uh, I was about to say it's good to see you. You can see me, but I can't see you. I wish I could. It's much more fun to do these workshops in person but at least it'll give you something to do to distract you from all of the craziness of what's going on in the world right now. And it also gives us something that's really therapeutic. I find sewing really therapeutic. I find sea glass art really therapeutic. And it's helping me with coping with all the anxiety over what's going on in the world. So we'll go ahead and do that today. If you aren't a member of the Town and Country Quilt Guild, welcome. I hope that you find this interesting and maybe you will want to make one of these small buildings as well. So let's get started. So I did write up the pattern and the instructions for this workshop and I sent it out to everyone in the Quilt Guild and you should have gotten that by email. And if you don't belong to the Town and Country Quilt Guild and you're interested in doing this workshop, you can find the pattern and the instructions on my website, JackieTrimperSeaGlass.com. So feel free to go there and download the pattern and then you can have it right in front of you while you're working on creating this small wall hanging. So my inspiration for this particular building was, it's the one room schoolhouse that both of my parents attended when, uh, when they were children. And when I was a little girl, this is close to where both my parents grew up. And when I was younger, every time we drove by, I was always fascinated by this little decrepit old building that was sitting on the side of the road where my parents went to school. And it fascinated me that all of the kids from grade 1 to 12 were in the same classroom, in the same room. So I was quite fascinated and my dad is a great storyteller and he would often tell stories about what it's like to go to school there and some of the antics that they got up to because the boys loved to get up to antics when they were little. I can't believe some of the stories. So it was always a fascinating spot for me. So not last year, 2008 in the spring, so two years ago, some vandals broke into that building and burned it down. And it was kind of heartbreaking, even though it was kind of a falling down old building. But that really inspired me to recreate this building in some art. So I did this building in a quilt art piece, and I also did it in a sea glass piece. So I'll show you my sea glass piece as well. Because often I'll do that when I get a pattern or design that I'm really enjoying. I'll do it in sea glass and I'll do it in fabric and it just kind of, it's inspiring for me. Here's a picture. I'll show that up really close. That's a picture of the actual schoolhouse. So if you're interested in doing a particular building that has some meaning to you, you don't have to do this building. I'm sending you the pattern for this building in particular, but you can take a building that has some meaning to you or a shed that you particularly like the look of or a barn or something that's interesting and you can use that in your quilt piece instead. And that's fine. So the format for this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a step of something you have to do and then what you can do is pause the video go off and do that step and then come back and then I'll show you the next step and then you can pause the video go off do that step come back or if you want you can watch the entire video through so that you know everything you have to do and then you can always come back and rewatch it if you want to 
If you watch the whole video through, by the time you get to the end of it, you might say, oh my God, this woman is crazy. There's no way I'm doing this. But I'll leave that up to you. I'm just showing you the way I do things and the way I like to create and be a little bit crazy when I'm doing stuff, but you want to do your own piece. The one thing I would encourage you to do, because we are in the middle of this pandemic and um, you can't go out shopping for supplies, the goal is to be able to do this with stuff that you have at home. So you don't have to make yours exactly like mine. You can use whatever materials you have at home and improvise. And you just want to have fun with it. So let's get on to step one. So the first thing you need to do is gather up all the materials that you need. So you're going to need your pattern and if you're doing your own building instead of the pattern that I'm sending you, then you'll need a picture of the building that you want to do. We're going to need fabric of course. So I'm showing you what I'm using for fabric for this project. I've prepared a bunch of strips of fabric. Now my goal for this particular project is I want to create as much texture as possible. So I'm going to show you how to do a technique that I would call raw edge strip piecing. So I've prepared all these strips in a variety of colors. I'm using hand dyed fabric. If you like hand dyed fabric and you use that, that's fine. If you don't and you want to use commercial fabric, that's fine. This is your project and you want to use what you have on hand. So whatever you can find. So just to show you how I prepared these strips, like all of these strips are maybe one to one and a half inches. Some of them are really crinkly, some of them are really straight. And um, I'm wanting to create or have all of these loose threads because I want lots of texture. So the way that I get this effect in my fabric, I'll just show you. If I have a piece of fabric like this, I just snip a tiny little bit at the end and then I rip it. And when you rip it, just like that, it creates this kind of loose piece of fabric with lots of threads hanging off. And so that's what I've done. And I've put, I've kind of arranged these really red, like not exactly how I'm going to have them. I'll show you when I do it, how I have them. But before you start your project, if you want to do strips, then that's what you would do. Get those all together. Now you don't have to do strips. I'm just going to give you a few examples here. Here's an example. Here I have greens, light to dark. Here I've got greens in commercial fabric. There's only five of them. Maybe you only want to do four. You need some light fabric for the sky. So you want some trees and grasses. Maybe some rocks and foreground down here. It doesn't ha even have to be all green. Just to give you an example, if you use a bunch of orange and pink and reds, you might get like a sunset type of sky. And, um, or if you use a bunch of blues, you might get like a night sky. So you can just do your strips in whatever you have on hand and whatever appeals to you. So this is just to give you a few examples. Just to show you don't have to create exactly what I'm creating. The other thing you're going to need for fabric is four different shades of brown. And this is how big my brown pieces are. I've got a dark brown, a medium brown, a medium light brown, and a light brown. And that's to get four different shades of brown for my building. And I also have a tiny piece of flowery fabric. Again, not a whole lot because I want to put some flowers in the foreground. And you need a piece of fabric to do your binding. And then you need a piece of fabric, approximately 18 by 14 for your backing. And you need a piece of batting, approximately 18 by 14 inches, that is, for your bat. So there, I have all those materials that I need. Besides that, I have a little tray here. And in my tray, I've got a little bit of organza because I might use that to add some more texture. I have threads. I've got a dark green to do the bottom part, a medium green to do the middle part for quilting, and a light green for the sky. I've got some brown thread to do the building. I've got some pink thread 
to quilt on top of the flowers. And I have different colored embroidery thread because I want to do some embroidery on it. I have six different shades of green. You can use whatever you want. You might not want to stick to green. I've got some green beads to put on it. I've got some pink beads to put on the flowers. I've got a bobbin thread that matches my backing. And I have some yarn because I think I'll couch on some yarn just to add a bit more texture. So this will give you a bit of an idea of where I'm going with my colors. The other thing that I have here is some sea glass and a few shells. I've got a piece of pottery here and I've got a few PEI rocks because this one room schoolhouse is from PEI and I felt like it needed a bit of a PEI touch. And those, all of this stuff comes from PEI. So let's get started. Now when you go to gather up your materials, if you come back with a piece of purple, with all shades of purple for your building, with a green roof, or with a fuchsia color, it doesn't matter. Whatever color you want to use for your building and for your background is going to work. So off you go to get your materials and then we will get started on the One next One more step. thing I forgot to tell you about, fusible web. You do need some fusible web. So you'll need a piece of that. That's the fusible stuff that comes with paper on the back. And um, the one that I prefer to use, this is Pellon Wonder Under. I've just had really good luck with Wonder Under. It always works for me, so I tend to like to use that. But you can use whatever fusible webbing product you have on hand. Anything is going to work for this project. So, step two, you need to prepare your pattern. So this is the pattern that I sent you. You can run it off exactly as I sent it to you and it'll come out on an 8x10 sheet of paper looking approximately like this. If you want to make it any smaller, all you have to do is shrink it or blow it up because the format that I sent it to you in is a picture format and so you can expand it or shrink it to make it the size that you'd like. This is approximately 8x10 10, or it's on an 8x10 sheet of paper. So if you're doing your own pattern, what you would do is you take a picture that you want to create and you need to draw a pattern of that. So here what I've done is from this picture, I've drawn a pattern of it. I blew it up. You'll notice that my pattern here is in reverse image to here. It needs to be reverse image in order to do the raw edge applique. So I blew it up here, I just drew it bigger, on a piece of parchment paper or you can use tracing paper, something so that when you flip it over, you can see the reverse image quite clearly. So this is what I actually used to make my pattern because then it's going to be in reverse image and when I fuse it onto the, pat onto the background, it's going to be this orientation, which is what I'm going for. And the other thing you need to do is color code your pattern. So you'll see that mine is color coded A, B, C, and D. A is the lightest brown, B is the light medium brown, C is the medium brown, and D is the dark brown. So for you, if you're using four different shades of purple, be sure you know which one you want to be A, B, C, and D. And then what you would do is you would trace each of those numbered things onto a piece of Wonder Under. So be sure to trace it on the paper side of the, of the fusible web or the Wonder Under, which is what I like to use, and label each of your pieces as A, B, C, or D. So you can see here I have the only piece that's A, which is the lightest brown, is this big piece here. So I've traced that onto my Wonder Under. And the B, I have this piece right here, plus one of the chimney pieces I have marked B. So I know that I want all of this in a light medium brown. So I have to separate these because these are going to go on my four different shades of brown. And then for my C, this piece and one of the chimney pieces is the medium brown. 
and then all of the dark brown pieces I've traced onto a separate piece of fusible web. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to press these. I've got my light brown fabric. This goes on to here. My medium brown fabric. I want to iron that onto there to activate the glue on the glue or the sticky side of the fusible web. I've got my medium to light brown here and I've got my darkest brown. So I'm going to press those and then when it's time to come and do my building my pattern will be all prepared for me. So for step three what we're going to do is prepare the background. So you want to move to your ironing board for this. I'm just doing this on an ironing pad on my table so that I can demonstrate it for you. So first put your backing piece of fabric down and press that. Press out any wrinkles. And some people like to attach their backing fabric on with some 505 spray. If you're afraid about your backing slipping, you can do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave it like that. And the next thing you do is put your batting right down on top of your backing. And we're just going to, this is what we're going to use to build our background. So the next thing I want you to do is take a piece of Wonder Under that is approximately 14 inches by 18 inches and you want to press that directly onto your backing. Be sure to put the paper side up because if you put the sticky side up the heat activation on the sticky side is going to stick to your iron. I've done that before. It makes quite a mess. So put that on, start in the middle and just press out. You can see my little ironing pad here isn't quite large enough, but um, I can just shift it around a bit. I'll just move it a bit forward to get this end and then back to get the other end. And then after you press that on, you have to let it cool for a few minutes before you pull the paper off. But you want to pull the paper off before you arrange your strips. Now, you, if you haven't worked with an iron-on or an iron-on um, pellon before or fusible web, you might be wondering why I'm doing this. And the reason I do this is that I'm doing a raw edge strip piecing, but I want to have a little bit of stickiness to hold the strips in place, or at least a part of them in place, so that when I go to quilt it, they're not going to move all over the place. But I don't want them stuck really, really firmly because I want to have all this texture in my background and I want to have lots of movement. Now, if you don't like working with fusible web or if you don't have any fusible web and you prefer to work with this 505 spray that helps things stick, then you can use that. The one thing that I would say, I prefer to use the Pellon because it doesn't stick until you heat activate it. So I can play around with the strips and put them in the order I want to put them and move them around without them sticking until I put the iron to it. So I tend to fuss quite a bit and then the iron doesn't go to it to make it stick until it's exactly what I'm looking for. Whereas with the 505 spray, as soon as you put your fabric onto that, then it's going to stick. And so you want to make sure you have it all laid out beforehand and you're not moving it. So that needs a few minutes to cool, cool off before I can strip the paper backing off. So there, it's nice and cool. Now I can just go like this and strip off that paper backing. So I have all my strips that I showed you earlier. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to arrange my strips on top of the sticky bits here. And they're not, it's not totally sticking yet because I still haven't put the iron to it. As soon as I put the iron to it, those strips are going to stick. And what I typically do at this stage is I lay the strips out and I'm going to lay them out from light towards the top and then I'll get darker as I go. Although I may stick a few strips in there that aren't 
It, they're not totally doing the gradation. Now the goal in laying these out is that you leave a little bit of each strip touching the batting so that when you put the iron on it, the heat is going to make that stickiness in the iron-on pellon hold a little bit of each strip in place so that when you take it to your machine to quilt the background, then some of it is going to stay in place. It still might shift around a little bit, but it won't shift around very much. I find it works best if you go top to bottom, layered on top of one another. And once I get it all laid out, then I often will kind of mess around a little bit, make it a little bit different. And this is to create a lot of texture. I'm wanting to have quite a few of these threads on the loose ends of the of the raw edge of each strip kind of sticking out a little bit. If you like things flat, 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 you're probably not going to like this technique. But for me, I like things not necessarily flat and sticking out. So I think I've fussed with my strips enough. I put the, a bunch in place and then I just kept fussing with them. And now I'm just going to take my iron and I'm going to start in the middle and just gently press. And then wherever the fabric is touching that iron-on fusible web, it's going to stick to the batting. Now because the strips are, I'm more concerned about how it looks on top, there are probably some strips that end up not getting any stickiness on the back of them. And you know, for that reason they may come loose or they may shift around a bit when I'm quilting it. But that's okay, I can just, it just all adds texture. What I'm going for, the effect I'm going for in this quilt is a, te a really textured background. And these strips will give a lot of texture and then I'll do quite a bit of embellishment too to add some more texture. So I'll get you to do that. The other thing, I'm going to show you up close my other one that I did. This one I did a little bit different. See look, there's one that didn't stick. You have to fuss with that a tiny bit. With this one, what I did was I used one piece of gray for the sky one piece of green for the grass and one piece of brown for the foreground. And then what I did was I added all of these strips on top. So that's another approach that you could take because I just added a few little strips to add texture. I added some, what do you call this stuff, cheesecloth, dyed cheesecloth and just some different textures of fabric, little bits and pieces, and some nice dark fabric right in the foreground, just to add some texture. So that was a totally different approach than the one that I'm showing you here today. So you can take whatever approach you want to build your background. So this is where I'm at with this one. Now because I want to make sure things stay in place when I move it to the sewing machine to quilt it, I'm just going to take some a few pins and pin things somewhat in place. I'm not going to use a ton of pins. So I brought this over to the sewing machine. I put my green bobbin thread in and I put my darkest green thread into the machine because I want to quilt it from the bottom to the top. Um, although I laid the strips out top to bottom, I want to quilt bottom to top. So I'm going to do this quilting free motion, but what my plan is, I'm just wanting to quilt lines, just lines back and forth and back and forth. So if you prefer to use your walking foot, then you can on this one because you don't have to have it free motion. I just really love to free motion quilt. So I'm going to do that. 
I'll just show you here what I'm going to, I'll show you a little bit and then I won't make you listen to me do the whole thing. So I want to kind of quilt it so that the edges, I put my needle down, the edges of each strip are still showing so that it'll add texture. Now what's going to happen because these aren't super glued down, you're going to have to do a bit of adjustment every time you come to a new strip. So I'm just going to free motion quilt back and forth and back and forth. There's not exactly a set way to do this. It's just whatever you feel like doing when it comes to the quilting is going to be fine. So there you go. I finished the section with the dark thread on the bottom. I'll just lift this up to show it to you. Uh, what I did, I don't know if you can see this very well, but I did like all flowing lines all along the bottom. Now for the middle section here, I'm going to shift my thread and use a medium green instead of a dark green. And then when I get up to the sky area, I'm going to use a light green instead of the medium or dark green. And I just want to point out to you, don't be too picky on this. Like you can see right here where there's a section where the batting is actually showing through. But this is a design where I know I'm going to be doing lots of layers in order to create all the texture. So if there's an area like that that doesn't work out just right, I'm going to be covering it up with another layer anyway. You'll see as I get going on this design. So there you go, I have my quilting all done on this piece and I'm just going to do a really quick press starting from the bottom working my way up just to help those stitches sink right into the quilt bat and even it all out a little bit. So that will not take long. And then once I do that, I'm really pleased with the way this looks. And one of the things I love about the raw edge strip quilting is that if I go like this, I have all these really loose ends because I don't quilt right up to the top of each little strip of fabric. And then I get all this loose thread kind of coming out. I'll pick the longer threads off, but a lot of it I'll leave right there. Now the other thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to attach a few more strips just to add another layer of texture. So this is where if you have any problem areas, like I have this problem spot right here where I have a tiny bit of bat showing through, I can just cover it up with another layer. And I think I'll put a few in the sky as well. It just adds another layer and the way I'm going to attach these is with some hand quilting or some hand embroidery rather. So if you look at the way I've done this quilt, I've laid these strips on top and then I've hand embroidered them on. And it just adds another element, another layer, and some more interest. So I'm just going to do a few of those on there. I'm not going to do the hand bit right now. There's another one I want to put on right there because I want to wait until I'm at the point where I'm doing some my hand stitching. So for now I'll just pin So it there's place. my background. Now I have to trim it down to size. So I'm just going to remove my ironing pad here and I have the quilt back on my cutting board and I have to trim it down. So I had originally thought 14 by 18 would be the right size but right now it's measuring about 18 by 21. So I have a few inches to cut off so I can be quite generous in my cuts here and I'm going to trim it down so that it will give me an idea where I want things to go in terms of placing the building and everything else. So I'm just pick my lines that I want and I'm not going to trim it quite as small as 14 by 18. And then by the time I finish it, before I put the binding on, if I decide at that point that I want to trim it even more, then I'll do that then. And I'm not going to worry about cutting off my, the ends of my quilting line because in the end I'm going to have a binding on it and then it'll cover up any of those 
little loose threads and it'll keep them from pulling out. So there my background is all finished and it measures 16 by 20. So it's a little bit bigger than I'm probably going to end up with, but maybe in the end I won't trim it down any smaller than that. It, this isn't an exact thing. You know, in the end it might be a little bit smaller than mine. Yours might be bigger than mine. It's just the size that you want that's just right for you and your building. So now we're at step five. We want to build the building. This is the exciting part. So if you remember, if you go back to your pattern, from the pattern we had made the small pieces. So we have A for the A part, B for the side and one little chimney piece, and C for the roof and one little chimney piece. So first I'll get you to cut out those three pieces. So one of the things that I find really helpful is that as I'm cutting out pieces for a pattern, I place them back on top of my original pattern. Just so that I know I'm going to get the pieces in the right place and I'm going to have them going at the right orientation. So that my building is going to look the way I intend it by the time I finish it. So those are the main pieces I want to put on now. So my pattern or it looks like this, but I want my building to go like this. So that's why the sticky stuff is on the back. And then I'm going to flip it over and put it somewhere on my piece like this. I think I'm going to put it over on this side. Now here's a good reason why I don't have my little strips sewn on here yet because I can move them. So I think I want my building somewhere around here. I'll wait for the chimney. I want to put these three pieces on so first. So then I just take my each pattern piece and I rip the paper off the back. Be careful not to rip the gluey stuff off. Make sure the gluey stuff is still on the back of your piece of fabric. So there I've got my light and my... This stuff can be fussy to pull off. My medium dark, my medium, light medium rather, and then the roof is the medium. And you don't have to worry about these overlapping because the eaves are going to go in here. Plus you're probably going to sew along that line when we do the quilting part. So I look at it and I decide is that where I want that to go. I know I want this part of the building to line up with the bottom of my quilt so that it's not crooked. You don't want to look like your building's falling over. So the main part of your building, you want to line up with the bottom of your quilt and then your other pieces line up with that, with that main piece. So I think that's a good spot for the building. I know I'm going to do some more stuff in the foreground here. So before getting the dark brown, I want to press this in place. And that's it. My building is attached. No going back now. And then I'm going to put my chimney on. There you go. I've got my chimney in place. And then I'll just press that on. And you'll see that there's a slight little gap between these. And that's fine because that's where the eaves are going to go. So that's where your D comes in, all of that dark brown. So now I'll cut out the dark brown. So again, I've laid my dark pieces on my pattern just so I don't lose track of which one goes where, keeping in mind that my pattern is a mirror image to the building that I have on my quilt piece. So first I'm going to put the eaves on because those I want to do one at a time. They're kind of skinny and and with this Wonder Under, it just works amazing because as soon as you press something in place, the heat from the iron activates the glue on the back of your 
little piece of um, fabric there. I did re remove the paper from the back of these before I put them on my pattern just so that I wouldn't have to fuss with, with each one as I went. So that's why they're just ready to go. Now I'm going to have to eyeball this a little bit. So my door, I know I want to be in the middle here. So I'll just set that in place. And then my two windows. I'll be sure to put them the right window in the right spot because they're all slightly different sizes. And I have my sign up here. And lastly, my three windows over here. Now think about what your building looks like in the picture. If you're doing your own, be careful to do this where you make sure that here this is the side of the building, it's going at an angle, so just to give perspective, you'll want to line up the top of your windows, but the bottom of the windows are going on an angle so that you get that feeling of distance as you move towards the back of the building. You, if you follow along with what you're seeing in your picture, you should be okay. So at this point you would decide if you wanted to add any other details using some raw edge applique. Just to give you an example, in the first piece that I did with the little building, I added an outhouse because my dad used to tell me stories about having an outhouse at their schoolhouse because they had no indoor plumbing. So if you wanted to use that for an example, you could make a little outhouse outside your building. I'm not going to put an outhouse in this one, but I did want to put some fence posts in. So using the same fabric I used for the side of the building, I cut three fence posts and I'm going to put those right along here. And I'm planning to make a bit of a sea glass path coming out here. So I think those fence posts will kind of run along the side here to help accent the path. And the other thing is I have this small bit of fabric. I put some Wonder Under on the back of it and I'm going to cut out some nice bright fabric to make a few flowers. So I'll make, a, I want them to put some flowers there and a few over here just to add a little splash of color. So I just kind of randomly cut some of my flowery fabric and I have a nice big flowering bush right here in the foreground. And I just added a tiny few flowers that I tucked underneath the raw edges of the strips here, just to add another layer of interest into the, this background. So I'm just going to press those things in place. And I'll also do a tiny bit of quilting on the fence posts and the flowers to hold them in place. Now I need to quilt it. So to quilt this, what I'm going to do um, I don't think you'll be able to see really clearly what I'm doing as I'm quilting. But what I'm planning to do is, this is a decrepit old building, so I don't want really clear quilting lines. I want them to be kind of rough, because the shingles on the side of the building were all falling apart and kind of falling down. So I know I'm going to plan to start from the top and make shingles. So I just kind of will go like this. It might even be helpful for you to draw this on your pattern. Practice your making shingles before you start. I'm using a free motion foot for this because then I can just kind of make these shingles look really rough and like they're falling apart. I'm going to plan to do this. I'm just doing this to show you. But I would encourage you, the first time I did this I drew it on my pattern. Made a make a photocopy of your pattern and then draw it on so that you're practicing your quilting line before you start to sew. In the end I found with the first one that I did that the lines were pretty even and nice and I think I would want them a little bit rougher so I think for this one I'm going to make them a little bit uneven. And then for the the side because you can't see the shingles as clearly I'm just going to make straight lines all the way across. And I think for the roof I'm going to do the same thing. I might do the roof, actually I might do the roof a little bit rough. And then the other thing you want to do is sew on your doors and your windows and your sign and do a little bit of a stitch in the eaves 
and you can either use your light your lighter brown thread or your dark if you want the stitches to really show or you can do your darker brown thread so, so I'm going to make an attempt to show you how I'm going to quilt the shingles on this building I know that making video is not my forte but I'm trying and um, I thought if I could give you a bit of a close-up it might give you an idea so I'm going free motion and I put my medium brown thread into my machine because that's the color I want to use. So using my free motion foot, I want to think about shingles. I don't have it all drawn out on my pattern because I don't want pencil marks to show. So I'm just going to create it as I go. So I'll ground it and I'll just go, I just want to go like this. And then I'll go down the side and then I'll do another row of shingles. And I don't want it very exact because this is kind of a dilapidated old building. And I just want to kind of have rough shingles. And you might be starting to do this and thinking, oh, this doesn't look very great. But once it's all done and together, as long as it looks kind of like shingles, it's not that big a deal. So I'm going to do this all down the front of my little one-room schoolhouse. So I finished quilting the shingles on the front of the building and on the roof, and I outlined the chimney, I outlined the sign, I did an outline of the entire building to attach down all the eaves and everything. And then I did some quilting on the door and all five windows. And then I did some quilting on the fence posts. So I've changed the thread in my machine from the brown to the pink. And now I just want to do a little bit of quilting on each of the little flower bushes and on my main flower down here. And then I'll be finished with the machine quilting portion of this project and I'll show you what I'm going to do with the handwork. So now I want to do a bunch of handwork in my piece. And every little thing that I do, think about adding layers and adding in anything that you do for embellishment is just going to add a bit more detail. So I have a bunch of different shades of embroidery floss and I want to do a running stitch along all of these little extra strips of fabric that I've added just to add some more interest and another layer there. And I have this um, bright green organza. So I think I'm going to cut a few little strips of this. I'll just cut a few tiny little strips of it and add them in here maybe in the background and I'll hand stitch some of those in just to add a little glimmer here and there especially in the bottom part probably only in the bottom part. So I'm just going to set some of those on there and then as I'm going along doing some of my handwork I'll kind of stitch them in. I love a little bit of sparkle and embellishment and this type of, of organza just gives a little sparkle to things that always kind of brightens up a piece in my mind. So I'll stitch some of those things in as well. And then I, I like to do couching and I'll often couch pieces of yarn on but I'll couch them on with, um, with the machine. But in this case, because I'm going for tons of texture, I'm going to use embroidery floss and couch them on by hand. And just to add some little bits of grass, probably down here in front. What I'll do is I'm going to take this away and work on it doing my handwork and then I'll come back and show you what I've done and point out each little detail. And then the other little detail I have, I have a bunch of green beads so I'm going to sew on some beads here and there. I'll probably do a, a bit of a combination of beads and embroidery floss to add some details in. And I have some little pink beads. They're more like fuchsia really that I'm going to put on the flowers. Just a few, just to make a tiny little glimmer so that when the light hits it, it kind of 
jumps right up at you and you see it. So I just wanted to give you a quick demonstration here of a few of the embellishing techniques that I use. So if you look here, I've couched on a few pieces of yarn. So to show you how I do that, I take a piece of yarn and I just have a short piece here and I double it up and then I start at the bottom. I'd like to put this piece up here. So I'm going to just start at the bottom here and so attach it on. Real, just with a few stitches. And then I do this um, thing, oh, I'm kind of at an awkward angle here. But then I just attach it on by hand. So you can do this by machine, but what I find when I do it by machine is that it stitches it down really, really tight. And I don't want it super tight. So what I'm going to do, just put a few stitches at the bottom, and then I'm going to come up about a quarter of an inch. Whereas if you do it by machine, it, you, it'll stitch much more closely than that and it'll pin it right down to the fabric of your quilt. And then sometimes I'll twist the two pieces together as I'm going just to make them a bit more interesting. So about every quarter inch I'm going to stitch there and then it, it makes the couched piece of yarn still kind of stand up a bit from the quilt. So that's as far up as I want to go with that couched piece of yarn. So I would just do a few stitches at the top. You want to do a couple there just to make sure it's nice and secure. And then I'll tie it off at the back. I always pull my knots to the back. You can see the back of my quilt is a bit of a mess. But I'm going to show you what I do about that in and a few And I minutes. just snip off the top like that. And that's just the effect that I was going for. And so you can see I did a few pieces here. I just wanted these pieces of yarn coming up from the bottom of my of my piece of work and I did a few there and a few there. So that's all I did for the couching. Now the other thing that I've done quite a bit of is just putting on random blades of grass and it adds quite a bit of texture to my whole piece. So again I'm going to use the exact same thread embroidery floss that I was just using. And all I've done here is I've just got, come from the back and I just randomly sew on little blades of grass like this. And I like to do this fairly random. I don't tend to have a real rhyme or reason about it just because that's the way I like things. You might want your grass to be all straight and even, whereas I like it fairly random. And I don't do it all over. Like you might get going and get really carried away and put a ton of grass on, which is great. Or you might just do a few little bits here and there. So if you look at where I've sewed on quite a bit of grass, I put some there, I put a few little blades here and here and here. One thing that I did if I move over, if you look up close on the building, on the one room schoolhouse, I put blades, blades of grass all along here so it looks like the grass is growing up beside the building. And then I put a whole row of grasses right here just to add some interest. So in some spots I don't have any, other spots I have quite a bit. So the other thing I really like to do is French knots. So I want to add a few of those in here. So again, I come up from the back with my embroidery floss. I do three loops around my needle, right back down again. Just come up from the back with my needle and the embroidery floss. Do three loops around my needle, right back down into the same hole, and then pull the needle through. And it makes this nice little French knot. Now some of the French knots that I've done are quite loose. Like if you look right here I've done some loose French knots and it just adds some more detail to the background. And sometimes I've done rows of them. I did a row of fairly tight French knots there. And I did some rows up in the sky as well. And over here on this part. And then sometimes it's more 
just some random French knots just to add a few details like I did in here and here. Now the other thing I did was I've sewn on quite a few beads. And what I do with the beads, I sew my beads on one at a time. So in some spots like right here, I have a whole row of beads. Here I've got bugle beads, I've got a row of seed beads, another row of seed beads. And I've picked out some pale green beads here that I want to sew onto the grasses. So it kind of looks like drops of dew or rain. If you look just at a glance at a piece like this, you don't see all these tiny little details. It's only when you look close that you see all these tiny little details or when the light shimmers off a particular bead. But to me that's what's really interesting about it. So, the last thing I wanted to do, I have my tray of beach treasures from Prince Edward Island. And I really wanted to add some detail here where I had some, some of these pieces of sea glass coming down from the door of the schoolhouse, right to the bottom of the quilt. So it gives me a little bit of a stone pathway. And it also adds that little bit of PEI touch because this is all PEI sea glass. But I'm not going to do that until after I put the binding on um, because what will happen when I put the binding on, if I try to put the binding on with the sea glass there, they're going to be in the way. So I'll do that later. The other thing that I'm planning to do, I have this piece of pottery that I think I'll put right there, a sea pottery piece that I thought might add a little bit of detail. And I have a few little stones here that I might put right on the base and a few little seashells. But I'm going to set those aside for now, but I'll have those at the end and I'll show you. And I'm going to attach them using this quick seal kitchen and bath adhesive caulk. It's a clear silicone. You can use fabric glue if you want. I have had good luck with fabric glue on fabric as well. So now I have to put the binding on. So I just wanted to show you the back of my quilt is really quite a mess. I have all sorts of overlapping quilting lines and lots of threads sticking out from all my sewing on of beads and embroidery and everything else. So I decided I'm going to put a piece of fabric on the back to cover up all that mess just to make it neater and tidier. So I cut a piece of fabric here that's matching in color so I think it'll go fine. And I also already made my label, so I cut out a piece of fabric to look like the front of the schoolhouse, just leftover fabric from the browns that I had, put on the name One Room Schoolhouse and my name, Jackie Trimper, 2020. And I'm going to put on a couple of, if you just cut a square of fabric like this, sorry, square of fabric, press it in half, put it up in the corner, same thing over there in that corner and then a piece of fabric across here and then it gives you a place to attach a hanger and then it can just hang on the wall because I like hanging things on the wall sometimes I'll put tabs on top but I like this way of hanging so I'm going to do that and for my binding I changed my mind on my binding I had some green fabric chosen and then I decided I'm going to make my binding a little bit different I'm going to put some brown silky fabric along the bottom, some green silky fabric on the bottom part of the sides, and then some beige silky fabric up around the top like this. So that's going to be my binding. So my one room schoolhouse is all finished. I've put on the binding and I've put on the last finishing touches of any stitching that I want and any beads that I want. And I've added my piece of pottery for the sign and my shells at the bottom of the fence posts. I have put the sea glass on to make the path from the door to the bottom of the quilt. And I've added a few rocks there and I am finished. 
And when you look at the two pieces side by side, you can see it's the same building, but a little bit of a different focus in terms of colors for the background. I've situated it differently on the quilt itself, and I've made the backing different sizes. So overall, it's just given me a chance to show you a few different approaches you can take and a few different techniques, and whatever approach you want to take with your piece is going to be fine. So I'm so glad that you could join me today for this workshop. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the comment section down below this video, or you can send me an email. And when you finish your completed piece, would you please send me a picture? Because what I'd like to do is put together a slideshow of all of the different art quilts that people have created, and then I can share it with everybody. Because within our quilt guild, we usually get together for show and tell, and we'll show everybody things that we've made. And it could be a while before we have our next meeting. So in the meantime, we can have a slideshow where you can see what everyone else has come up with. And if you're not part of the Quilt Guild, you can also participate in that slideshow because I'm sure everyone would be really excited to see what you've made. Because I'm assuming that a lot of the pieces are going to look quite a bit different than my two here. You can see the differences between these two. So the things that you guys are going to come up with are going to be even more diverse. It'll be so interesting. So in the meantime, I'd really like for you, I'd really like to send you my best wishes. I hope that everybody is taking really good care of themselves. Take good care of yourself physically. Take good care of yourself mentally. That's what this workshop is all about. It's giving us something positive to focus on during these crazy times of this pandemic. And in the meantime, if you get a chance to get out sea glass hunting, happy sea glass hunting.